I heard again, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, like uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Jay Kelly. Uh, he's a professor of biology and environmental science at Raritan Valley Community College. He's a New Jersey native and has a, a BA in biology, PhD in ecology and evolution from Rutgers University. Uh, for the past 15 years, Dr. Kelly and his students have conducted extensive research on rare plant biology and conservation in ecosystems across New Jersey. Uh, this year, the New Jersey Native Plant Society has started partnering with Dr. Uh, Kelly uh, in, with these projects. Um, in addition, he's been working on the impacts of deer and invasive species and other factors on New Jersey forests. Okay. He and his students are conducting ongoing research into the long-term results of deer exclosures, uh, hunting programs, prescribed burnings, and uh, native plantings. Uh, we may also hear a few words about his Sea Beach Amaranth Conservation Project and public participation in that kind of those endeavors. So I'm very um, pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jay Kelly to everybody. And the floor is yours, Dr. Kelly. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. All right, so I'll try to share my screen now. Hopefully this sure. goes without a hitch. Yeah. All right, that looks okay? Yep. Looks Great. Good. Well, thanks again, Hubert, for the invitation to come talk to you all, to the society as well. Hopefully next year we'll all get to meet in person. Uh, it's always really uh, encouraging and inspiring to be around other plant lovers in the state. Um, so I guess we'll just have to make do this year uh, through Zoom and, and be grateful that we at least have this way to connect with each other. Um, so I'll be talking to you today about the impacts of deer and invasive plant species on our forests, primarily in northern New Jersey, and then I'll review some of the different solutions and strategies for tackling these problems um, based on some of the research that we've been conducting as well as others uh, in the region. Um, as members of a native plant society, I'm sure the problem of deer populations uh, is not new to you. Um, but before we get into some of the impacts that deer are having on our forests, it's important to take a step back and realize that the recovery of deer in our area really represents a conservation success story, and it's recognized around the world as such, because approximately 100 years ago, around the end of the 1800s, deer had been exterminated throughout most of their range in North America, white-tailed deer in particular, uh, including in New Jersey, and it was really only the work of, uh, through the work of generations of conservationists and hunters and legislators that um, deer were able to make a comeback. And so you can see this, uh, some data from the University of Georgia that they compiled for the southeastern, southeastern states on the left. And you can see that still by 1950, um, white-tailed deer were still uh, absent from much of their historic range. Um, but by 1970, they had largely recovered throughout most of that range and were already starting to show some signs of problematic levels um, returning to some areas. And the reasons why deer populations exceeded their background historic levels is because a number of conditions had changed during the course of the last century that allowed them to rise to levels that had never been seen before. Um, the first thing that happened was the historic extermination of natural predators, primarily wolves and cougars in our area. But uh, equally important was the fragmentation of forest environments by both agriculture and suburban development throughout the eastern seaboard which created the ideal conditions that deer prefer, which are edge habitats in forests, and also provided supplemental food resources in the surrounding landscape that deer could rely on, in our yards, in our gardens, our landscaping, and in farm fields. And that additional food source, combined with the lack of predation, really allowed deer populations to uh, increase exponentially far beyond what had ever been seen um, previously on the continent. And so you can see that since the 1970s, deer populations continued to rise, such that by around 1990, they had risen to really problematic levels throughout much of the eastern states along the Gulf of Mexico and Great Lakes region, um, and certainly in, in New Jersey. The colors that you see on the map here, we'll talk about the significance of these numbers in a second, but yellow indicates populations that are above 15 deer per square mile, and red indicates areas where deer are above 30 per square mile, both of which are problematic to varying degrees. Um, historically, deer were thought to be approximately 10 per square mile, uh, and it's um, Important to recognize that deer, again, are a native part of our ecosystem. They play an important role in our forests, serving to disperse the seeds of plants and also to suppress the plants that have an, a competitive advantage over other species. And so when deer are at the, the proper population densities, they can actually play an enhancing role in supporting biodiversity in the forest by creating room for other less competitive species to be able to get a foothold. 
Um, when deer get above 10 per square mile, though, we've seen a number of studies from our region that show that um, certain kinds of impacts start to take place. And the first thing that tends to happen is that the preferred browse species, the, the species that are the tastiest to deer, start to decline um, noticeably in the landscape. And that's been seen with trilliums in Pennsylvania and the Great Lakes. It's been seen with swamp pink down in South Jersey, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's been seen with hemlocks in the Great Lakes and the northern states. Um, and so those species that are preferred by deer begin to decline. When deer exceed 15 per square mile, you start to see tree regeneration begin to shut down um, dramatically as a whole, with significant declines in really a whole host of tree seedlings in the understory. And then when you get above 20 deer per square mile, you start to see effects happening throughout the food web because the vegetation, of course, is the primary food source of, of everything else in the forest ecosystem. And so you see declines in insects and amphibians and bird populations, as well as changes to the physical environment with increased erosion, soil compaction, nutrient cycling, um, problems with water quality and so forth. And so historically, our forests looked like the image that you see here on the left. This is a photo from the 1970s at the Rutgers Research Forest in central New Jersey. And that's a, a portrait of a perfectly healthy forest where you can see ferns and wildflowers on the forest floor, a, a nice shrub layer above that with maple leaf viburnum in this case and other young trees um, growing with them. Uh, and you can't see very far into the forest as a consequence of that really rich vegetation diversity and density. Unfortunately, the populations that we see in New Jersey today are far above those historic levels that we saw back in the 70s. And the sites that you see uh, today are, are, are what you see in the, in the right two photos with either nothing growing in the understory or uh, a diversity, or sorry, a richness of invasive plant species um, filling that void that the deer have created. The last statewide population estimates for deer that were published by the state government were uh, conducted in 1998. Uh, and they determined that there was an average of 38 deer per square mile, roughly four times the amount um, of deer that we need for everything to be in balance in the forests. Uh, but it was uneven, uneven across different parts of the state with the Pine Barrens in South Jersey supporting only about 13 deer per square mile and the highest densities occurring here in central New Jersey where our community college is located uh, of above 70 per square mile. Um, but the, this is you know, data that's 20 years old at this point. Uh, and we've been conducting research for the past few years to identify current population densities in the state, at least in the northern half of the state, using thermal um, sensors mounted to drones, uh, which provide the most accurate measures of deer populations in the landscape. Uh, and so the historic data you can see in the, in the photo on the top left of, with deer populations increasing from 10 to 38 um, by 1998. Today, the average deer density in northern New Jersey is 70 per square mile. And in central New Jersey, where you know 20 years ago it was in the 70s, Today, it's 112 per square mile, more than 10 or 12 times um, the, the amount of deer that are needed, again, for everything to be in balance in the forest and for forests to support the full suite of plant and animal species um, that we all want to see around today and into the future. Um, so this presents a real challenge for us at a, at a really broad regional level. Um, we didn't collect data from South Jersey, but uh, we can, we've seen impacts for a lot of the species there as well. Hubert was mentioning some of these in uh, the early competition about the uh, plant species of the year. Uh, swamp pink is a perennial um, evergreen lily species in the uh, Atlantic white cedar swamps and shrub swamps of the coastal plain primarily. Uh, we did comprehensive surveys of swamp pink populations around 10 years ago and found that 90% or more had been impacted by direct uh, signs of deer browse. And really the only places where swamp pink was thriving were in areas that we refer to as natural exposures, where uh, the basal rosettes of the plants had been protected by deep mucky waters that the deer, um, that provided a barrier for deer movements. And anywhere that the plants occurred on the mainland areas adjacent to the rivers and streams where deer had access, we saw them being browsed to the ground and you could see some photos of what that looked like in the bottom right. Um, so these are some of the signs that we're talking about of the preferred browse species suffering impacts from um, deer. And this is the place in New Jersey where the populations of deer are at the lowest. Uh, and so if that's what's happening in the Pine Barrens, you can imagine what that means for these kinds of preferred browse species in northern New Jersey. They're just already gone in, in most parts of the state. So in addition to looking at individual species like that, we've been doing kind of comprehensive surveys of forest structure and composition in northern New Jersey following in the footsteps of Rutgers researchers. And we're really fortunate to have a rich data set from um, Rutgers forest ecologists that goes back to the 1940s. Murray Buell in particular set up shop in 1948, and he and his grad students in the next 25 years documented forests across central and northern New Jersey, looking at basic conditions and plant diversity and uh, density and structure. 
And so we tried to identify as many of those exact locations as possible and recollect the data that they had collected um, during that time period. And the beauty of this data set that um, for us is that all that data that Marie Buell and his students collected was prior to the deer population explosion that we've seen in New Jersey. So it's an invaluable reference data set so we can see exactly how our forests have changed during that time period that deer populations have exploded that are of concern. So all the red dots that you see on the map there are places where these historic studies were conducted and we were able to identify the location and follow up with um, present day data. And the short of it uh, is depicted largely in this slide. Uh, we saw major impacts to tree regeneration in particular. Um, the small seedlings uh, did not show major signs of decline, even though it looks like that in the bar graph. Uh, in each of these figures, you can see from left to right, the historic data set is in the gray and the same site studied today are in green. Um, and even though it looks like there's uh, changes in small seedling levels, um, those numbers are replenished every year from seeds raining down from the canopy. And they're inherently more variable because they're um, responding to precipitation and masting of the different tree species. Um, the problem is that those small seedlings rarely survive into uh, larger size classes. So uh, the next graph that you see in the top center are the large seedlings that are more than a foot tall. We saw 80% declines in the densities of those large seedlings. And that translated into 75% declines in the next size class. And the, the concern is that if these trends continue, we're gonna start to see these declines translating into actual reductions in canopy trees as well, because the trees aren't gonna live forever. And with the increased mortality that we're seeing from storms and invasive pests and diseases, um, there's a real deficit in the understory of young trees that are waiting to fill their ranks. Uh, and if these trends continue, we're very likely to see forest losses taking place uh, in much of Northern New Jersey. We also saw declines in other categories of understory vegetation, including the native shrubs, woody vines, uh, and herbaceous plants, which we lumped together uh, everything from wildflowers to ferns, uh, grasses, and anything that was non woody. Uh, and so, you know, we're seeing 50 to 80% declines in almost every category of understory vegetation, um, which is really catastrophic for the species that are depending upon them, not just the plant species themselves. Um, there was variation regionally in the state, uh, and deer are an edge species, as I mentioned, and so the places that have the largest, most intact uh, forests in the northern highlands above the glacial moraine and the Kittatinny Ridge, we saw the least amount of uh, declines of uh, tree regeneration, but there were some, still were significant declines even in those places where the forests were most intact. The places where forests were most fragmented in the areas that historically had been used for agriculture had the greatest amounts of uh, regeneration deficits. Um, and the uh, these phenomena really extend far beyond New Jersey. This is not just a continental phenomenon, but really a global phenomenon at this point, because we've successfully, unfortunately, eradicated predators throughout much of the planet at this point. And so white-tailed deer are increasing throughout much of their range uh, in eastern North America. In the western parts of the continent, you can see other deer species increasing with research from Vancouver Island and elsewhere showing impacts. Um, you can see research from Japan and Europe and pretty much everywhere where there's large ground-dwelling herbivores uh, their populations are increasing. We're seeing uh, forest decline as a result of um, excessive population levels. And so again, you can see how the, the regeneration deficits and the increased browse severity is the greatest in the mid-Atlantic region where we're located, according to the U.S. Forest Service here. Uh, and that corresponds really closely with the areas with the highest deer densities from that earlier study from University of Georgia. And at this point, we have about 80% of our forests in this region are suffering from moderate to severe levels of deer browse. Um, as I mentioned, the decline in vegetation translates into declines of the other species that depend upon them. And you see these cascade effects or trickle down effects through the food web. A cascade uh, is another word for waterfall. And so it's, it's a very large trickle, so to speak. Um, and there's been a lot of really good research from the Allegheny uh, National Forest in Western, Western Pennsylvania documenting these kinds of cascade effects um, using deer enclosures where they kept captive deer at different densities to see how the forest responded to those uh, variable deer populations. And what they found was that as deer populations increase, you see declines in tree diversity, which translates into declines in caterpillar density. Um, and after hearing uh, Dr. Tallamy's talk this morning, I'm sure that should be no surprise, um, given the diversity and um, specialization of uh, these uh, lepidopteran herbivores on the particular species that they depend upon. And the uh, Caterpillars are the preferred uh, food source of many bird species in the forest. Most of our forest birds are insectivorous, at least at certain stages in their life cycle. And so the declines in caterpillars have translated into declines in bird populations. The high end of the x-axis that you see here, these are in uh, 
deer, number of deer per square kilometer. But that trait translates into about the same levels of deer that we're seeing in uh, northern New Jersey on average today. Uh, and so in the Allegheny National Forest, when deer had reached that level, they had seen you know, 40 to 80 percent declines in caterpillars, birds, and other wildlife. Um, and so we would expect to see similar uh, declines happening in New Jersey as a result. Um, deer populations impact not only the food uh, sources through the food web, but um, nesting resources as well. And so a lot of bird species, for example, depend on understory vegetation as nesting habitat. And so if there is no vegetation, there is no habitat. And so the studies that have been uh, taking place here in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the last 20 years have shown uh, predictably declines in uh, shrub and ground nesting birds. So the study on the left here is from the Rutgers Research Forest. Um, and they looked at changes in bird populations since the 1980s based on where species nest in the forest environment. And each circle there indicates a different species and the large circles indicate significant changes anything below the line is a decrease. And so you can see that 100% of the shrub and ground nesting birds in that forest had declined significantly since the 80s. And the majority of mid-story canopy nesters had as well, because we're talking about decades worth of deer pressure that's translating into a deficit in the entire understory in many forests. Um, that was just from one forest in New Jersey, but more recently, just a year or two ago, a study was conducted in, uh, with all of Pennsylvania bird data showing more or less the same thing panning out with all of the uh, low nesting forest birds declining significantly and the high nesting forest birds not showing any meaningful changes over time. Other studies uh, that have compiled data for the entire continent by Rutgers and other researchers have shown this to be more or less consistent across um, that entire range. So again, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just happening in locally here in New Jersey or at the state level. Uh, and this is certainly a factor for um, many of the large scale declines that we're seeing globally, both for insects and for bird populations. So there's been a number of major studies in the past few years documenting really catastrophic declines in insect populations in Europe and North America, um, as well as birds since the 1960s and 70s. And while forest birds haven't declined as much as some other uh, bird species, um, they have experienced about 20% declines. And there are many reasons for that, including loss of wintering habitats, uh, pesticide exposures, uh, all sorts of things that are impacting birds and insects. Um, but clearly this is a major factor that's contributing to these widespread declines. Uh, and unfortunately it isn't uh, given the same attention as some of these other uh, more conspicuous factors. So in terms of strategies for addressing these sorts of problems, um, the one of the, the places where uh, regeneration historically was most obvious were in light gaps. As a tree would fall in the forest, it creates increased light conditions that favors tree growth. Um, trees and other plants typically grow faster when, there's, when they're exposed to more light, as I'm sure you're aware. And so in those light gaps, you tend to find much denser and um, more vigorous regeneration. And so because of that, um, one of the measures that are traditionally used to increase tree regeneration in forest environments is canopy thinning. Many foresters will um, use such prescriptions to you know, stimulate tree regeneration and understory growth. Um, and if you have moderate to high deer populations, about 20 to 50 per square mile, um, you can still see that sort of regeneration taking place in New Jersey with, with vigorous growth in those light gaps in the forests. The problem is that the deer are still there and they're selectively removing the things that are tastiest from that. And so certain species like oaks and dogwoods and hemlocks are gonna get uh, removed from that growth and you're gonna get um, the growth favoring the species that are least palatable to deer, like hickories and different birch species uh, and so forth. And so we saw in our comparisons of past to present forest conditions, dramatic changes in species composition in our forests with this shift to increased abundance of the species that are at least palatable. And so while oaks um, are really important for so many wildlife species, moths, butterflies, and many others that depend upon them, they are some of the most preferred species um, that deer like to eat. And so if we're interested in increasing oak regeneration, uh, it's really important to tackle deer as a part of that. Um, so you do get regeneration in these light gaps, but it's selective regeneration. And the problem with using this as a forest uh, restoration tool is that the increased light also favors invasive species coming into the forest and growing, and the growth does provide additional food for deer. And so if you're not simultaneously managing deer while you're using canopy thinning, you're actually gonna make the deer problem worse because you're feeding deer populations. And canopy thinning traditionally has been used as a, as a main tool for deer management throughout the region. Um, for folks that are trying to increase deer populations, canopy thinning is a really great strategy because you're going to increase food sources on the forest floor to support deer population growth. So um, that's at you know moderate deer levels of 20 to 50 per square mile. 
as we talked about, deer, uh, many of our forests have many much higher levels of deer at this point. And when you get into those kinds of situations, you don't get any native regeneration at all. If you look at light gaps in places like Washington Valley um, Park and many others in central New Jersey, the light gaps are just full of nothing but invasive species. Um, so there's no young trees growing up in the ways that we would expect to see or historically did see. Um, instead, what you find in this image here, you can see Japanese angelica tree is the only tree, but it's really a shrub coming up. Beneath that, you've got Japanese wineberry, and on the forest floor, it's a monoculture of uh, Japanese stilt grass. Uh, and so if you have these really high uh, deer populations in the area and you use canopy thinning as a tool, you're actually going to be really potentially irreparably harming these forests by stimulating invasive plant species growth. You're not going to get benefits for native regeneration at all, and you're still going to be supporting increased deer populations because the deer are going to be removing everything from that understory that's native that's growing. The worst case scenarios are when you combine these uh, severe deer population levels and lack of tree regeneration with the other kinds of impacts that are happening to forests, whether it's severe storms from climate change or invasive pests and diseases. So in our area, we're seeing widespread devastation of forests from emerald ash borer, for example. Um, and ashes were really important, in, uh, important for recovering forests and post-agricultural soils. And so in many of those places where forests have regrown as farms were abandoned, you see really low densities of trees with ashes being one of the dominant trees. And as they disappear from emerald ash borer, what we're seeing is the forests are not recovering from that um, event. Instead, what you get are on the left here is an example from Bridgewater, a thicket of invasive shrubs and vines, or on the right here, an image from Raritan where there are nothing but herbaceous wetland plants or invasive um, species to replace them. And so if these trends continue again, and we have continued impacts from uh, pests and disease species affecting our trees or increased severity of storms, we're going to begin to see forest loss taking place in much more widespread areas in the state if we don't address this fundamental problem of elevated deer population densities. So this is clearly a priority uh, for future forest restoration and conservation. One of the other strategies that's really uh, popular, especially right now when everybody's interested in planting trees to uh, combat climate change is tree plantings. Uh, Everybody loves planting trees. It feels good. It's a wonderful thing to engage in to do. Um, but depending on what trees you're using and what the situations are, it might have varying degrees of effectiveness or be in, in some cases counterproductive. So if you're using trees to rest, uh, return forest to an area through reforestation or what's sometimes referred to as afforestation, this can be a re really beneficial measure to kind of accelerate the rates of uh, tree colonization into open uh, farm fields, for example, whether it's along a stream buffer or in any other area you're trying to get a forest to return to, um, it's beneficial because then the trees get a, a foot up above the um, competing with the herbaceous plants, which grow really densely and vigorously that they'd otherwise have to compete with. Um, and many tree species, especially the large nut bearing species like hickories and oaks, tend to disperse less readily than the wind dispersed species. So if you're trying to get oaks and hickories or um, other large nut bearing species to grow, uh, planting the trees themselves is a good way to get that started uh, to accelerate that recovery. Planting trees in forest environments doesn't necessarily make as much sense because the trees are already putting far more seeds and seedlings into the landscape than we could possibly ever replicate. Since we know exactly how many trees used to be in our forest prior to the deer population explosion, we can actually predict exactly how many we should be planting to restore the understory conditions there and what the costs of that would be. And that translates into more than $15,000 per acre. If you're going to actually replant all the large seedlings and saplings in the forest that are no longer present. And that's not really feasible for us to be doing at the scales at which uh, we need to to restore our forest understories throughout the state. Uh, and so right now we're actually partnering with the Sourlands Conservancy to uh, do some research to figure out um, whether um, planting trees in understories and protecting them from deer is a even yields any kind of success in terms of tree survival and growth, and also comparing that to um, putting these sorts of deer cages around um, native seedlings that have regenerated on their own. So the seeds that are sprouting and germinating um, naturally, we also protected some of those, and we're going to be comparing their survival and success over the next couple of years to see what the relative benefits of those two strategies for forest restoration are. Um, there was a recent uh, video that was put out by uh, some researchers through The Guardian, if you're interested in some of these concerns about large scale tree planting efforts and, and some of the nuances and uh, related to that, uh, it can be really beneficial in combating climate change or for forest um, conservation efforts, but it also can be counterproductive, as I mentioned. And so that's a pretty good uh, primer on some of the issues that are involved from around the world uh, where people are planting billions of trees uh, right now to try to combat climate change. And to try to inform these efforts in New Jersey, um, since we have this historical data set, 
um, that we've compiled. In the next year, we're going to be trying to um, produce some materials that can help inform these efforts locally. So if people are interested in planting trees in the Sourlands or the Piedmont or elsewhere, um, we can look refer to these historical data sets to see what kind of species are most appropriate to those situations, um, whether it's trees or other understory species that might be of interest. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to produce that sometime soon. Um, since the trees are planting themselves and are far more effective at it than we are, a more cost effective way of um, taking advantage of that is uh, using deer exposures or deer fencing. Depending on what kinds of materials you use um, and how large the exposures are, um, they'd be maybe more or less cost efficient. So typically, if you're using the cheapest kind of materials and you're trying to protect about an acre worth of property, it'll cost between $800 and $1,000 um, for an individual acre to be protected. But because um, there's of uh, the math that's involved, um, the larger the exposure, uh, the cheaper it is per acre in terms of forest protections. And so when you get up to 100 or 1,000 uh, acres that you're protecting with an exposure, you can see that the, they become much more cost effective. Um, but this is just the installation and just the material costs. You know, you have to pay for labor. And then the other thing is that you have to make sure that the, the fences are maintained uh, and they need to be maintained for more than 10 years to have effective forest restoration take place because um, trees are going to fall on the far, uh, on the fence and bring it down. Uh, deer are going to break through the fence um, and any number of other things can go wrong as well. And if deer get in there, uh, they can get trapped in there and can actually make um, browse impacts worse. Uh, if they're not addressed right away. And so it's a really important uh, restoration tool that can be very cost effective at small scales. Um, it's, but it's problematic at really large scale levels because of its expense um, and the difficulties in doing this at the regional level that uh, we have these kinds of concerns. Um, but one of the nice things is that when you put up a deer fence, usually the, the effects are almost immediate. If there is a seed bank in place, even in the very first year after the fence is installed, you can start to see the wildflowers bounce back and tree seedlings start to bounce back really vigorously. And the shrubs that might have been browsed to the ground are going to start to, you know, appear really lush and, and grow um, like gangbusters inside the fence compared to adjacent areas. So these are just some photos from the dozen or so exposures we installed uh, in our area in the past few years with really clear early signs of success already taking place just in that very first growing season. If the fences are maintained over time, you can look to some of our conservation partners in the region that have had much greater um, foresight and have done this for decades now. In places like Duke Farms, where they reduce their deer population and have a square mile deer exposure that they've maintained for more than 15 years at this point, you can see really clear trajectories of tree seedling growth happening within those places, um, with the large seedlings in particular re bouncing back to historic levels in about 10 years' time, um, which was great to see. And this is planting no trees whatsoever, just letting the trees restore themselves and keeping deer either out of the exposures entirely as they did until Hurricane Sandy or after Hurricane Sandy, they allowed a small resident population to be maintained within the exposure at about 10 per square mile. Um, and you can see the incredible growth that took place in young trees within um, Duke Farms. And that's clearly one of the best showcases for looking at the impacts of deer management on forest recovery and regeneration uh, within our area at the state. If you keep those deer exposures installed even longer, um, you can start to see um, the sapling level recover, layer recover as well. Uh, after about 15 years, that next large size class of trees recovers. Um, and I would imagine in about uh, 10 to 15 years longer, you'd start to see recovery of the tree layers as well. Um, and this is, again, doing nothing more than uh, putting up a deer fence and maintaining it uh, with moderate levels of deer uh, occasionally occurring within there. Uh, and this is a really clear indication that deer are the primary factor to address with tree regeneration because all the other factors that are impacting our forests are still occurring within these deer exposures. There's still acid rain and climate change and invasive pests and diseases. There's trails and human disturbance. There's invasive species. And yet, despite all those things taking place in our area, if you just correct the deer part of the equation, uh, you can see the forests respond really vigorously without any additional effort. Um, and so there's some real signs of um, hope that we can uh, have if we um, really take this issue seriously. And then uh, you can also start to see in, uh, from some other research that's been conducted elsewhere in our region, this is a study from Virginia that found that after about nine years of a deer exposure being in place, you start to see the bird populations bounce back as well. Um, and so those cascade effects that we talked about earlier that are leading to declines in our animal populations and ultimately to the physical uh, components of the forest itself can be reversed in the same sort of way and get positive effects translated from just addressing this problem of deer. 
And so just to turn it on its head, I tried doing a little animation here. Let's see if it works. So if we can correct the deer problem, referring back to these cascade effects, we can see tree diversity bounce back. Um, and with the return of tree diversity, we can see hopefully improvements in caterpillar and other insect uh, fauna returning. And with that in place, we should get to see, as we just saw from the previous slide, uh, benefits for bird populations. And this kind of positive cascade effects for re restoration were actually observed in Yellowstone National Forest after wolves were introduced in the 1990s. Uh, I should say they were reintroduced. And you can see in the top left there, when wolves were brought back into Yellowstone, elk and other uh, herbivore populations declined initially with uh, consequent decreases in browse impacts to vegetation. And because of that, we saw the different tree species occurring in that area, as well as shrubs and other uh, vegetation recovering in response to that decrease in browse effects of, of elk. And because of the benefits of the increased vegetation, we saw wildlife populations increase. This is just data for bison and beaver, but if you read some of the other research by Ripple and Beshta, um, they've shown improvements to insects and birds and grizzly bears, all translating um, as a result of this just initial reintroduction of wolves that corrected the herbivore problem. And so while it's unfortunately very unlikely that reintroduction of natural predators is going to take place in the near future, uh, at least intentionally in New Jersey. Um, we do have similar techniques that we can use um, through predation to bring deer populations back under control through hunting uh, or deer management. Unfortunately, recreational hunting alone is not likely to be sufficient to correct these deer problems. This has gone on in New Jersey um, for decades. Um, and while there's still many areas that need to be opened up to hunting to have some kind of impacts to deer populations, um, we're not seeing major responses in forest understories in places where recreational hunting is occurring. However, if you uh, turn, you know, put the proper kinds of incentives and policies in place for um, identifying what local deer populations are and figuring out how many deer you need to take out of the forest to get these kinds of recoveries to occur, using you know, harvest goals and quotas for hunters to try to achieve. Um, this is referred to as management hunting. And in the places where that's occurring or sharpshooting is occurring, we do see meaningful benefits in forest understory vegetation. Sharpshooting is the fastest way to accomplish this. If you bring in professionals from the USDA or private sector uh, outfits like White Buffalo out of Connecticut, um, this can be accomplished in a matter of a few uh, evenings or weeks. The problem is it's really expensive to do it that way. It can cost anywhere typically from $200 to $300 per deer uh, for these means to be used, um, but it is effective and you get results that will last you several years afterwards. Management hunting can be then used to keep the deer populations much lower um, once they've been reduced by culling. Um, and that can also be um, joined with recreational hunting at the same time, which can provide some uh, opportunities for people to uh, get the benefits of hunting, um, but also have some management goals taking place to further suppress deer populations in those areas. And so you can see in the photo in the bottom left, this is an area that was management hunted in northern New Jersey, and you do see signs of a healthy understory taking place there. Um, not quite as much as you'd get with an exclosure or as much as occurred historically, but still meaningful benefits. Um, the problem is that this is, again, really expensive. Um, uh, you know, the idea of spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to um, or every few years to hire sharpshooters to call the deer herd is not something that a lot of townships would find uh, you know, possible or favorable. But if you turn that around and look at what we're actually paying in terms of the costs to farmers and crop losses and to our landscaping and our vegetation impacts in our gardens, uh, as well as to deer vehicle collisions, that factor alone would easily make uh, the cost of sharpshooting worthwhile. Uh, this is data from State Farm Insurance from the past couple of years. You can see that some of our local townships have several hundred vehicle claims a year um, where people are reporting vehicle claims to the insurance company, uh, damage from deer vehicle, deer collisions. And with State Farm estimating that each about $4,000, that's translating into $800,000 or more in vehicle impacts alone um, to repair the vehicles, not to mention the pain and suffering and hospitalizations and injuries and unfortunately deaths that are resulting from these collisions as well. And so if we as communities invested $100,000 or $200,000 a year in calling the deer herd to bring it to back down to levels that are manageable by recreational and management hunting, we would see tremendous cost savings in our community in, in declines in vehicle damages because there's really clear relationships for that we've seen from our research in local deer densities and the amount of collisions that take place in those places. Uh, and that this is borne out by research as well. 
So some of the earliest communities that started sharpshooting in New Jersey, in Princeton, for example, the very first year they uh, engaged sharpshooters, they reduced their deer population by about 60%. And that same year, they saw a 60% decline in deer vehicle collisions. And so what you get essentially, in the same way that we get positive cascade effects for ecological restoration, you get positive cascade effects for the social and economic effects that we're seeing uh, resulting from deer populations as well. And so we could expect to see benefits for farmers, benefits uh, economically and for public safety in terms of re reductions in deer vehicle collisions, um, as well as public health in terms of Lyme disease and other infectious disease um, prevalence that's related to tick populations as well, because deer are the main vectors of ticks throughout the landscape uh, in this area. Um, and to make it even more affordable, uh, we can also look to what other nations have done to tackle these same kinds of problems. As I mentioned, this superabundance of large herbivores is happening throughout the northern uh, world, whether it's in England or continental Europe, Japan or elsewhere. And a lot of other nations have chosen to return to commercial harvesting of deer, to allow deer meat to be sold in restaurants and in some cases in markets, um, to provide an economic incentive to reduce those populations. And so whether you're looking to the, the Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden, they've been doing this for years. England's been doing it for years and pretty much every country in Europe, as well as Australia, Argentina, for other game species as well. The risk for returning to commercial harvesting, of course, is that um, we theoretically could drive deer back down to extinction in the ways that we saw nearly 100 years ago. But if you look to the places that have been doing this for decades, the um, encouraging thing is that many of them have find, found that the, um, the, not only are the strategies successful at managing deer populations, but there has actually been a reduction in the amounts of illegal harvesting that's, that's taken place because it provides economic resources that make, that make it easier to, for regulations to uh, be implemented, to manage the hunting, to make sure that's being done at sustainable levels, uh, and enforce um, penalties against people that are hunting illegally. Uh, and so there's a lot of examples around the world I think we could turn to, and there are many groups in New Jersey that are starting to consider the possibility of trying to um, reinitiate com commercial deer harvests, and other states are as well. Um, um, and, you know, these concerns are not new. They're, um, we're essentially dealing with the legacy effects that of how deer were managed and wildlife in general were managed hundreds of years ago when uh, we had eradication programs to eliminate these predators from our landscape. Uh, Aldo Leopold was the first to write a book on wildlife management. He had participated himself in these wolf eradication programs out west and realized the mistake that was being made. Um, and and uh, you can read his accounts of that in his famous book, The Sand County, Sand County Almanac. Uh, but he said, essentially, we need to learn to think like mountains. We have to think about how these things are interrelated with each other. You might want to eradicate wolves and panthers to benefit your livestock, but then you're going to have legacies of impacts to forest regeneration, to uh, erosion and losses of water quality, and ultimately consequences that can extend generations into the future as a result. And so he said, we need to think like a mountain. Um, and you can apply the same thing locally here as well, whether it's historically or today. So just this past week, I, I stumbled over some historical accounts of these same wildlife eradication measures that were taking place in Hunterdon County and our region. And you can see from the mid 1700s, uh, the bounties that were being put on place on wolves and panthers in our own area with a single court settlement uh, providing a, a hunter with um, you know, rewards for bringing in almost 100 wolf and panther pelts. Um, and all of the townships locally were engaged in those same kinds of activities, divvying up the amount of resources that it would take to eradicate wolves and panthers from our region. Uh, and we're still suffering the consequences of this today. So while they thought that they were doing a, you know, benefiting the public good during that time period, um, they weren't thinking like a mountain in this way that Leopold encourages us to do, to think outside of our single-minded um, efforts to eradicate predators for some sole benefit because the predators have an important role to play as deer do themselves. And it's up to us to think about this in this from this perspective to try to bring positive benefits back into the future. Um, and that's very likely to occur if we begin to, to take this approach to ecosystem management in general. Uh, and we should be holding our public servants accountable for this, but ourselves as well, because we're all part of this story and have a role to play. So that's uh, the issues with deer in a nutshell. Um, and I'll go through a little more quickly, quickly with the problems of invasive plant species. It's an equally complicated story um, and re requires different strategies in some cases to address. If you look back to that historic data set that I was talking to you about earlier, you can see in the mid 20th century, there were invasive plant species present in our forests, but they were not frequent at all. Um, most of these plants that are now you know, widespread and overrunning our forests and our uh, farm fields um, 
only occurred at about uh, less than 5% cover in any of these forest studies that were conducted. Only Japanese honeysuckle uh, was, was prevalent with two forests having about 20% cover. Um, most of the uh, understory was comprised of native species, as you can see in the green bars there. Um, but of course, the invasive plant species have risen, risen dramatically during the same time period the deer populations have increased. So while we saw declines in our native uh, understories, invasive plant species stepped in to fill that void because these are unpalatable to deer. Um, and in our region, in the Northeast Corridor from Boston down to DC, we have some of the highest concentrations of in, uh, invasive woody species of anywhere on the continent. The only places that are comparable in the country are uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and you can see just how in the dark blue areas there on the map, um, how uh, much more elevated these levels are in our area. Today in New Jersey, in non-indigenous species represent about 40% of all the plant species that occur in the wild in our state. And that number is increasing. Um, and while the, the impacts are many, um, they have the same kinds of food web effects that we saw taking place with deer. Uh, Dr. Talamy, uh, who we're lucky to hear from this morning, has done some of the most important research in this regard. Some of the early data he published showed uh, comparisons of these introduced species and some of their native relatives. And so I just took some excerpts from his research that had been published on his website. Uh, and you can see that in the elm family within the tree group, um, our native elms are supporting hundreds of different moth and uh, butterfly caterpillars. And the close relative that's been introduced from the old world, the Zelkova, doesn't support a single one, according to his research. And so while they're very similar species that can occupy similar niches, they don't have the same kind of benefits for our native um, invertebrate fauna. In the shrub layer, just two examples from the rose family, you can see our native spirea supports dozens of different moth and caterpillar, sorry, moth and butterfly caterpillars. The close relative, the false spirea from Asia, has been found to support only two. Um, and this translates again throughout the food web with some research from New England showing that forests that are infested with Japanese barberry have found um, major declines in, in um, other kinds of herbivores as well. It's not just the insect herbivores that decline, but the predators that decline in response to their populations decreasing. And even the detritivores uh, decrease as well because all these invertebrates are operating primarily on chemical cues that tell them what's food and what isn't. And these invasive plant species, while they do provide some benefits to our forests, they're still sequestering carbon to some degree, they're still providing some nesting habitat, for example, they don't provide anything like the same sorts of quality resources uh, for food, in particular, uh, for invertebrates as our native species do. And so the same cascade effects are resulting from invasive species. Um, deer are part of this equation as well. As we mentioned, uh, the invasive species are the least palatable to deer, so they will eat invasive species, but they choose to eat them last. And so um, if you look to the deer exclosures that we've studied, um, in those places where deer have been removed from the equation, you can see native uh, vegetation bouncing back and outcompeting invasive species in many places. The vines and, and herbaceous layers in particular have been really successful in, in outcompeting the invasives once you take deer out of the, the equation. Um, and so what's happening is essentially is the deer are suppressing our native species and that's what's allowing the invasive species to rise up to the levels that are occurring. The shrubs haven't bounced back to the same degree, um, primarily because of seed source factors. Uh, there are so many invasive shrubs in the landscape at this point that when you um, remove deer from the equation, there's still an abundant seed source available that brings them right back into those places and they still outcompete our native shrubs because there are so few native shrubs around in many of our forests, especially in the fragmented forests in central New Jersey, that they just can't bounce back on their own. And so additional efforts might need to take place in suppressing invasive shrub species um, or supplementing the native shrub by planting them into the forests uh, directly. The other factor that's really important to consider that's uh, favoring the prevalence of invasive species in many areas is uh, forest history and land use. Um, much of our forests today um, are fairly young forests that are growing up on abandoned farm fields. Uh, as economic conditions changed in the early 20th century, many farms in our region were abandoned and farms reverted back into forest environments. And so we've benefited from dramatic forest recovery uh, as a result. The problem is that these forests that are growing up on soils with a history of disturbance, um, and in some cases degradation from agricultural activities, look very different than the old intact forests um, that have been around since the um, pre-colonial era. And if you look to those forests that are old and intact in the landscape, um, if you and compare them uh, native and invasive composition, they're about equal parts native and invasive in terms of the woody species present. Um, the herbs are still holding out a little bit better. But if you look to these post-agricultural forests, that are growing up on abandoned farm fields, um, they are far more uh, comprised of invasive species in the understory than native species. 
Um, and so um, these forests look radically different than any kind of forest that have ever existed in these sorts of areas. And so in addition to deer, um, we have to think about land use history and those sorts of contexts um, that might favor invasive species growth over others. Um, and you can see this really readily as you walk through any of our local forests. Um, you'll cross an old stone wall on a trail uh, and that indicates that on one side of that wall, there was a farm field at some point historically, even if there's a forest there today. And if you look at this image, you can see on the left side, there's next to nothing in the understory of the forest. That's an old intact forest. And on the right side, the forest is lush with green vegetation where that's all invasive species, Japanese barberry and wineberry uh, and uh, multiflora rose in this case. Um, and so it's like night and day and you can still see these legacy effects from agriculture uh, nearly a century later. Um, taking place in our forests. And this is important because the scale of these forests in New Jersey is enormous. Almost 50% uh, of the forests that occur in Northern New Jersey are comprised of these post-agricultural forests. Um, and so if they're this infested with invasive plant species, this clearly has to be a priority for forest restoration in the future. And targeting these forests in particular for suppressing invasive species and trying to um, recolonize them with our native species that are so lacking um, and so needed to support wildlife in these places. Uh, in doing so, and trying to knock back this incredible wave of invasive species, there's a couple different tools available that are useful uh, to consider at this scale. Um, herbicides and, and mechanical treatments are possible, but they can lead to collateral damage, uh, impacts to native species or fauna or, or water quality um, or soils for that matter. And they also tend to be much more expensive. The um, more affordable and more endemic sorts of um, approaches involve either using biological controls uh, or prescribed burning. Unfortunately, with biological controls, there are it can be a really useful strategy for tackling invasive species in general, but there just isn't enough research um, to provide solutions in this regard for the, the hundreds of invasive species that are already occupying our landscapes. And so while that's a really potentially fruitful avenue to pursue in the future, uh, right now it doesn't really offer um, a meaningful solution for tackling most species that we're trying to deal with. Fire, on the other hand, is an endemic part of our landscape. Many of our species are adapted to fire. And we know that for thousands of years, Native Americans were burning our forests regularly for hunting and for agriculture and other uses. Um, and so we've been doing research for the past three years to try to determine whether fire might be useful as a tool for suppressing invasives as well. Uh, and we found some pretty hopeful signs. Some species like Japanese barberry, Japanese wineberry, I'm sorry, not wineberry, um, multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle are hit pretty hard by fire. Even a single fire will reduce Japanese barberry by about 50% and subsequent fires can reduce it even further. And when you see a fire moving through a Japanese barberry stand, it's really clear um, how that takes place. The fire, it's got very thin bark. And after the fire passes through, you can watch that bright yellow sap just boiling out of the cambium uh, of the barberry. And it really knocks it back uh, substantially. Other species, however, are just as adapted to fire as many of our native species, like Japanese wineberry, for example, um, actually increases in response to fire. So if you're going to be using fire as a tool for invasive species suppression, it really is important to do a survey first to figure out what species are invading your forests before you think this is going to solve anything. Because if, if you have wineberry or some of the other species that respond positively to fire, you're actually potentially going to make the problem worse. The other factor to consider is that in this world of increased deer populations, if you burn an, a forest understory where there's healthy regeneration taking place and there's either a, a healthy shrub layer or young trees growing up, um, it'll knock those species back as well and the deer will keep them knocked back. And so this is just an example uh, from Voorhees State Park. It was burned once three years ago and you can see the area on the left had been burned. There, even three years later, there still isn't very much uh, regrowth of young trees compared to the adjacent area in the forest on the right, which was not burned. And you can see the lush growth of spice bush and um, maple leaf viburnum and young trees growing up in that area. So if you've got a high quality forest where there's a healthy understory already in place, then prescribed burning can actually be really detrimental um, to knocking back that uh, advanced regeneration and understory quality because the deer again are waiting there to um, potentially browse it back down to the ground uh, once it's put into reach. So in terms of tackling this strategy of or this problem of uh, invasive plant species in a landscape, the best strategy is prevention. Um, 
We're continually introducing new species into the landscape. It's almost entirely uncontrolled at this point at the state and the national level. We have new species being imported into North America every year or exported from it for that matter into other parts of the world. Uh, and we really need to start thinking about en enacting some legislative controls against uh, this in the future to have any um, chance at restoring our forests in the long run. Because even if we knock back the species that are infesting our forests today, we'll just be dealing with another one tomorrow or 10 years from now if we don't address um, this from the standpoint of prevention. And again, we're all part of this story as well, so we can get involved either in uh, choosing what we plant um, in our landscapes wisely, making sure that we plant native species, which I don't have to tell anybody in this group about, I'm sure. Um, engaging with groups like the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team that are trying to identify emerging invasive plant species and tackling them before they get to these problematic levels. Um, and doing our part to try to reduce disturbance to the high quality forests that still remain in much of the state, um, making sure that the wrong kinds of forest policies aren't implemented in those places that could be really counterproductive and lead to worsening quality in those uh, forests over time. Um, one of the best things that we can do locally is to try to identify and preserve our old forests. We're really fortunate in New Jersey to have maps of old forests going back to 1899. Um, and with the aerial imagery that's available today on websites like the Conservation Blueprint um, or the GeoWeb or other um, online tools, you can see where these old forests were in 1899 and, and follow them all the way to the present in the succession of aerial photographs that are available, identify them in the landscape and try to target them both for preservation and restoration because they tend to be the highest quality forests as it is with the most intact seed banks and soil. Um, and it's gonna be the easiest to revive them into the kinds of conditions that we need to support wildlife. And right now they have no status um, for conservation or protection other than what people voluntarily give them. And so those of you that are on you know, open space advisory boards or environmental commissions in your communities, these are really important resources to target for, for conservation and restoration purposes um, that require us all locally to get involved until some sort of protective status is implemented for these old uh, forests in the state. There's, I have an enormous number of people to thank uh, for putting all this together. Our, we've, we've had really great fortune in having uh, cohorts of students move through and contribute to our uh, research program that have just been phenomenal. And this is some of the smiling faces um, that uh, collected all the data for us here at Raritan Valley. We also have um, community partners um, that have supported our work, giving us permission to study their forests, or in some cases, providing resources to help pay our interns to get this work done. Uh, and I owe them a lot of thanks as well. Um, some of the research that was cited in the study is here in case you wanna look more into it. And I can provide you with any uh, additional literature that you might be interested in if you wanna look into these complex um, issues in more detail. Um, best way to get in touch with me is by email. Um, and we are creating a website so you can see all the other fun stuff we're getting ourselves into uh, in the world of plant conservation and research in New Jersey. Um, so before I take questions, uh, Hubert asked me to give you a little bit of information about this new partnership that we've created with them on uh, CB Jamaranth conservation. So I'll try to give you a little bit of backstory as quickly as possible. Um, we've been working on coastal plant conservation for uh, 20 years at this point. Um, and this year, uh, we're engaging in a partnership with the Native Plant Society to uh, team up and try to do even more uh, to protect our coastal beach species. Um, sea beach amaranth, in particular, is a federally threatened plant species that occurs on beach habitats in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and it's an exciting species to work with because for 100 years, it was uh, gone from New Jersey. It hadn't been seen since 1913. And in the year 2000, it reappeared in Monmouth County up by Sandy Hook. Uh, the following year, I was sent... Um, to survey the rest of the beaches in the state and we found it in all the other coastal counties as well. And so we've been every year doing surveys for this species and for other coastal rare plants and trying to um, protect the habitat so that it has a chance of you know, sticking around and hopefully increasing uh, into the future. Sea beach amaranth occurs only in this narrow strip of land above the high tide line and up to the foot of the dunes. It won't grow in the dunes at all. It's just on that upper beach surface. It's an annual plant and it travels by wind and waves. And so wherever it occurs one year, isn't there's no guarantee it's gonna be there the next. And it could you know, appear a mile down the coastline or even farther. Um, and unfortunately, of course, uh, in, in a place like New Jersey, uh, these, impact, these habitats are subjected to all sorts of human impacts. Um, some of the more important um, human activities that are affecting sea beach amaranth and these habitats in general are, are beach raking or grooming, which occurs on all the recreational shorelines of the state. Uh, tractors and other tools are used to, to groom the surface of the beach every morning to prepare it for beachgoers. 
And that of course uh, destroys any plants that are trying to grow on the beach or beach nesting birds for that matter. And this is occurring on about 75% of all the beaches in New Jersey. Um, even more widespread is off-road vehicle driving, either for official uses by um, you know, park staff or municipal staff or uh, for garbage collection and public safety or for recreational use for sport fishing. Um, over 80% of our beaches are affected by these activities. And there's no better place to see the impacts of off-road vehicle use than Island Beach State Park. Uh, in their northern natural area, uh, it, uh, recreational driving is restricted and only park rangers are, are able to drive up there. And you can see really lush beach vegetation growing in those places. Immediately to the south of the northern natural area, it's open to recreational vehicle use. You can see um, the beaches are rutted with tire tracks and there's no vegetation, uh, amaranth or otherwise, growing in these beaches. So uh, the good news is that there's really strong room for compromise uh, to, to improve natural resource benefits in these beaches because the upper parts of the beach are rarely used by people. So we did some research on peak tourist days throughout the, the year, looking at where people were located on the beach surface. And you can see um, in Seaside Heights there um, in the central photo, the places that would be occupied by plants have been raked clean, but people aren't really using those parts of the beaches. And the same is true for the, the places where people are driving on the beaches as well. So we can potentially protect the upper parts of the beach and allow for these plant species uh, to occur there, while at the same time still allowing for recreational uses to occur, which are so important economically and culturally in New Jersey. Um, and so we've been doing that for the past 15 years, working with partners like Pinelands Preservation Alliance, the state parks and other groups to try to uh, keep people from driving on the upper parts of the beaches. And the beauty of this is that it's really cheap. It costs about $100 for a mile of protection. You put a stake in the ground and tie some string between the stakes and all the seeds wash back up on their own. You don't have to do any planting whatsoever. Um, and so this has been really successful. We're working in about 20% of the New Jersey coastline at this point, doing these kinds of activities. Um, we're also monitoring townships and parks where there's uh, agreements in place with the state government to make sure that the protections that are, uh, or parts of the beach that are supposed to be protected are actually getting protected. And that doesn't always work out that way. Um, but what we've seen since we've engaged in these activities, our sea beach amaranth in particular has really responded dramatically to these improvements in habitat, um, you know, increasing, you know, several hundredfold from the, the low levels that we had observed through most of the, the past 20 years. Um, and again, with, with no more effort than just putting stakes in the ground with volunteers and letting nature do the rest of the work for you. The other benefits that you get from this are these beach species are also the first step in dune succession. So the, as soon as the plants get established on the beach surface, they, they anchor the sediment in place and they start to accumulate sand that gets blown in the wind. And so a few years after those plants establish, you typically get low-lying dunes occurring. And so this is an, uh, an aerial image from one of our drones at Island Beach State Park. And you can see here this whole strip of dunes that, you, that, that are growing uh, at the foot of the larger four dunes on the left um, has all come in completely naturally as a result of these efforts of us putting these posts in the ground. Uh, since in, in Island Beach has been since 2008. Um, you know, this would cost millions and millions of dollars if we had done this artificially, uh, constructing the dunes and planting the beach grass. But just by putting these wood stakes in the ground and keeping people from driving on the beaches, the dunes have recovered entirely all on their own um, since Hurricane Sandy came through in 2012 uh, with no additional effort. And in addition to the dunes recovering, we've seen uh, other rare plant species like sea beach knotweed and sandwort coming back. The beach nesting birds have come back to Island Beach State Park in places where they hadn't been seen in more than 20 years. Um, and so nature does all the work for us if we just, you know, pull back on those limiting factors that are preventing that um, restoration from occurring or recovery from occurring. There's been a really nice um, story map put together by the NJDEP on sea beach amaranth and these coastal dynamics uh, in the past couple months that I'd encourage you to take a look at. It's really informative uh, and full of lots of great historical information about shoreline change and uh, sea beach amaranth in the state. Uh, and you can find that online. And again, here's my contact info. We're gonna be looking for volunteers very soon to, to go install these uh, beach fences around the state to try to protect our rare beach plant species and dune development. And uh, we'd really love to have uh, some folks from the society and your membership to come out and join us. It's, it's a lot of fun out there and um, we could certainly use more help because we got a lot of ground to cover. So thank you for all your attention and interest. And if there's time, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, well, um, let's see, we have um, a little bit of time. Um, okay, we're till um, 12.30, okay. Oh, okay, we have quite a bit of time. All right, uh, we have a whole bunch of questions and I think um, Kim is gonna work on the chat and uh, she has done some already, but um, did you wanna say anything, Kim? 
Um, well, okay, I'll go ahead with some of these questions here first. And Kim can think of anything that she wants to say. Uh, what kind of state response do we have to the, um, the um, deer uh, problem? Are they looking at it? Or are they thinking about doing anything? <laughs> What's happening? It's variable. It depends which part of the state government you're considering. Um, the Division of Fish and Wildlife uh, has a number of different tools that farmers in particular can rely upon. They can get depredation permits to help reduce populations on their farms. There's grants available through NRCS um, and other sources to put up deer fencing around farms. And so farmers have gotten a lot of support and attention that, that they need for sure. Um, there's been less um, effective policies in place to benefit uh, natural areas of various kinds. The same kinds of tools could do a lot of good in those places, but there aren't always the same sorts of um, policy solutions in place, whether it's depredation permits or resources to help fund deer exclosures. Um, the, the division as a whole has um, recognized the impacts that deer are having on um, forest environments, but in many parts of the state, their policies that they're implementing are still designed to actually increase deer populations. Um, and so they do have a toolbox available for local townships and landholders to try to tackle deer populations locally, but I don't think that they're taking the issue seriously enough as they need to at, at the state level um, where these impacts are happening. Um, and different approaches really should be taken. A lot of it, their uh, efforts have been focused on opening up areas to hunting, which is a really important um, first step that a lot of communities need to consider to try to address the problem. But as we've talked about, recreational hunting alone is not likely to bring down the deer population in any meaningful way for these kinds of environmental benefits that we're interested in. Um, and so we really need to, to think more broadly about other kinds of solutions. And um, I haven't seen the same kinds of uh, positive responses to those ideas uh, coming from the state level, unfortunately. Well, um, one person asked, uh, why doesn't the recreational hunting uh, work any better? Is it just because we have too many limits, uh, too many regulations for the recreational hunting? And could we really uh, relax some of those regulations? No, New Jersey actually has some of the most liberal hunting um, regulations in the country. Uh, the, we have a hunting season that, is, that extends from mid-September to mid-February in most parts of the state um, with a whole host of different tools that you can use as a hunter to, um, to, to harvest deer. Um, there has been, I think, somewhat of a decline of, of hunters and um, interest in hunting compared to historic levels that factors into this. Um, but the bigger problem is that I think people uh, don't spend as much time hunting as they used to. You know, it takes a lot of work to, to kill a deer, even the people that are most skilled at hunting. I've heard from Mike Van Cleff working at Fovos that, you know, his hunters that are, you know, really skilled and know what they're doing, it takes on average about nine to 10 hours worth of work to get a single deer. And so if you've got a population where you're trying to reduce the, the deer population by hundreds, um, that's, you know, a full-time job for several people to try to bring down the deer population. And people, you know, recreational hunters just don't have that luxury to go spending all their time in the woods for, for the to benefit the public good in this way. Most hunters are just trying to get a, you know, a deer or two to fill their fridge, um, put a trophy on the wall, and maybe in some cases, if they get extra deer, they'll, get, they'll donate them to hunters helping the hungry. But the amount of work um, that's required to really tackle the deer populations that we're seeing requires far more time and energy and resources that we can really uh, expect from our hunters. It just wouldn't be fair to expect um, you know, private hunters to be putting all the, the weight of this work on their own shoulders when there's no economic benefits or advantages necessarily for them to engage in it. And that's why, you know, opening up market hunting potentially so that they can actually have an incentive to take extra deer and put the work into it that's involved so they could sell the meat to local restaurants. Um, that would be a potential solution that could make better use of recreational hunters and the services that they're providing because they are services. It's just not, um, incentivized in the right sort of way that we can expect the kinds of uh, um, reductions to take place that we need. Uh, we have another question on the uh, deer wasting disease and possibly other uh, diseases from deer. Um, would that be a problem in expanding the, uh, the deer as a, a market uh, commodity? It could be. Um, the chronic wasting disease, there's no record of it yet in New Jersey, but we do have other diseases, EHD and blue tongue and other diseases that are uh, affecting deer populations locally. Um, you know, I'm no specialist on wildlife diseases and we have no, you know, there's no uh, programs right now taking place that engage in these kinds of market um, incentives. So I would have to look to Europe 
um, and these other countries that are engaging in these activities, because I'm sure there's there's diseases affecting those populations elsewhere. And you know, the, the, again, the benefits of uh, market solutions is that it creates a revenue stream that could be used to monitor deer populations, the prevalence of these diseases that could be tested before they get sold, for example. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that resources could be made available to tackle those sorts of questions and concerns, um, which are legitimate concerns. Um, but I don't think we have any, you know, evidence, unfortunately, at this point to draw from, at least on this continent. Um, so I, I don't have any other answer than that. And, and so the uh, articles that I put on one of the slides here um, have really nice surveys uh, of these programs from around the world, and you can look to those as potential resources to answer some of those questions. Okay, yeah, and it's being recorded, so uh, that should be available for them. And I'd be happy um, to share the PDF to anybody that wants the presentation as well. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, people asked, uh, how can they help right now? Is there some steps that they could take to uh, alleviate the deer problem and make a positive impact? Yeah, I mean, this needs effort at every level. So from the household level, you know, thinking about how we can protect the properties that we own from the impacts of deer and providing, you know, little arcs to encourage native plant diversity to improve and hopefully seed into surrounding areas. There's, there are things that we can do at home, even at just that level. But in our communities, there are things that you can engage in on a larger scale. Most townships in central New Jersey have, you know, several thousand acres of open space that they own that are not necessarily being managed for deer at all in some cases. And so making sure that your townships are doing their job at managing deer in their open space properties is a simple first step that can take place. Many local townships still have ordinances on the books that uh, prevent people from firing, um, from discharging firearms at all, even for hunting purposes or from hunting uh, using bow hunting as well. And so making sure that the ordinances on the books uh, and the local uh, policies are, are in place to try to tackle these problems. And that's something that we can all get involved in in, um, in uh, pressuring our local officials or just getting involved through our local advisory boards. And then of course, at the state level, the same sorts of the current concerns are in place. And so um, working with groups like uh, the Partnership for New Jersey Plant Conservation, uh, New Jersey Conservation Foundation, the Farm Bureau in New Jersey, um, the Highlands Coalition, the Sourlands Conservancy, there are many groups that are really for decades have been concerned about this deer issue and have been interested in policy changes. Um, and hopefully in the next few years with the right amount of public awareness and support for these new initiatives, um, we'll, we can see some meaningful change at that state level that we need the changes to occur. Um, so there's any number of ways that you can get involved at the different scales that you might find um, suit you or are available to you. Okay, hey, uh, how high do you uh, suggest that a deer fence should be? Um, it depends how big the exclosure is. If you've got a small exclosure where you're just trying to protect, you know, the plants next to your house or a small island of uh, native plants in your yard, uh, deer don't like to jump into enclosed places. And so I have a, a garden in my backyard and the fence is only four feet high and there's never been a deer jumping into that. It's only about 20 feet by 20 feet. Um, if you have a larger patch of woods or an area you're trying to protect, the recommendation typically is a minimum of eight feet. Uh, and deer can even jump over eight feet. So you're still gonna have to monitor it because sometimes they'll just barely make it and then drag the fence down. Um, the other strategy is you can have a smaller fence, uh, whether it's four or five feet, and then put a wire on the outside of that fence, whether it's an electric um, wire or uh, just a wire with flagging. Uh, and that'll keep the deer far away from the fence that they can't easily gauge how high the fence is. And it will also prevent them from jumping into the fence um, because they don't like to jump into those smaller spaces between the wire and the fence. So there's, there's, it really depends on um, what you're trying to protect, but in general, if it's a large area, a minimum of eight feet is typically required. Hey, uh, how would you answer the uh, golden warbler question? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Well, the question is that we have to chop down the uh, mature forest in order to give the golden warbler room to uh, grow and uh, prosper. Um, that might be necessary in some places. Um, there are other things that we could do first, like the, the golden wing warblers, for example, occurred in power lines in northern New Jersey. And one of the reasons for the decline has been the change in management policies of how the, the power lines are maintained. Uh, and by working with those companies, we could potentially benefit the warbler in those places. Um, we can create an expanded habitat, um, you know, clear cutting areas adjacent to those uh, power lines to, to create some additional habitat for the warblers. And that's being done in places like Sparta Wildlife Management Area. Um, but it's important to be smart about how we do that, make sure that you're not increasing 
edge uh, for deer uh, that's going to increase local deer populations or impact native uh, wildflowers or rare plant species or other habitats and species of concern. Um, so golden wing warbler deserves our attention. It's an important species that uh, is declining in our landscape and, and there are tools that we need to take to address it, but they don't necessarily need to be done in ways that are counterproductive for all the other kinds of things that we're concerned about. Uh, and they, those concerns need to be given, um, you know, I think uh, equal levels of attention and, and effort as the golden wing warbler. Okay. Uh, has any serious uh, consideration been done for uh, introducing uh, uh, carnivores, uh, predators for deer? Um, in New Jersey. Not to my knowledge. There, the, so after the, the successful introduction of wolves to Yellowstone, they, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service apparently tried to do the same thing in the Smoky Mountains in Western North Carolina, and it wasn't successful. Uh, and from what I understand, the reasons for that were um, a couple of factors, but one uh, was that there are a lot of domestic dogs in the area and the, the wolf population suffered from um, diseases of domestic dogs. They got distemper and other diseases that caused their populations to decline. The wolves also did not stay in the park. They went into the surrounding landscape, which caused problems. And they also interbred with domestic dogs. Uh, and so that's in a place like the Smoky Mountains, which is a much larger intact forest than we have in New Jersey. And so the prospects of wolves being introduced to New Jersey, um, for me, doesn't seem very hopeful. It might work way up in the Adirondacks or in New England. Um, but around here, it's hard to imagine that that could be successful. Cougars, on the other hand, I think could recover quite easily in New Jersey. Um, they're much more secretive and solitary, and um, they've arrived on their own. There was a cougar that appeared in Connecticut a couple of years ago that got hit by a car, and using genetics, they actually tracked it down to, I think it was a population in Montana or Wyoming, and it had traveled all the way across the continent entirely on its own, only to get hit by a car in Connecticut. Um, there are also occasionally cougars that get released uh, as pets. People, I don't know why, uh, have cougars as pets and then realize that's a bad idea when they get fully grown and then release them. So there was a, a one in the Sourlands for a while that had been living there uh, for a few years that I don't think there's any signs of recently. Um, so I think there's some hope that cougars could be reintroduced into the landscape, but whether people would tolerate that's another question because cougars, unlike wolves, are actually predators of people <laughs> as well as domestic uh, animals and pets. So it's hard to imagine that people would accept the uh, intentional reintroduction of cougars um, maybe in time we'll see them return on their own and hopefully we'll be enlightened enough to figure out ways to tolerate that and to adapt ourselves to their presence. Um, it's hard to imagine that wolves could be successful in these kinds of fragmented landscapes uh, that are so heavily populated by people and domestic dogs um, that they could actually um, recover here. But that's, uh, it's a world of possibilities and, and I think all those things are worth thinking about and, and considering and in some cases trying. Uh, is there any um, word on uh, deer birth control methods? The, um, the studies that I've seen in the literature um, show that that's a much more expensive means of um, deer management. You know, we mentioned that sharpshooting costs about $200 to $300 per deer. Uh, birth control can be upwards of $800 or $1,000 per deer. Uh, and the problem with birth control, at least the pharmaceuticals that have been approved and are for use uh, in New Jersey, and tested here um, are that they, you need to re-inoculate the deer every couple of years. And so that means you have to tag the deer to figure out which ones you've inoculated, keep track of them. And so it's much more time intensive um, than just you know, shooting a deer with a dart and walking away. You have to figure out which ones you've already shot, keep track of those. Uh, and so it's a much more intensive effort that's required. The pharmaceuticals themselves are often unreliable. And so in general, it's not really, at, even for economic reasons alone, very feasible in the kinds of open landscapes that we have. And then we're talking about hundreds of thousands of deer that are occupying these areas that we would have to begin to manage that way. So if you have a captive deer population in a zoo, then these kinds of pharmaceuticals can work really well to, to suppress um, reproduction. But in the open world where you can't uh, contain the deer and you have to tag them and try to manage that um, deer moving across boundaries in the ways that they do, it's not really feasible in the same sort of uh, way. So there doesn't appear to me, at least with the current array of pharmaceuticals available, um, any hope for that being a strategy for deer um, management in the future. Uh, how does the um, human activities, road building and house building uh, compare with the, um, uh, the effect of deer pressure, uh, human pressure compare with uh, 
deer pressure on the native plant populations? Um, well, I you know, road building and, and those kinds of activities are important things to be aware of. They, the, the soil disturbance that's created by them favors invasive plant species. It creates forest fragmentation that favors deer populations and invasive plant species and leads to all kinds of other uh, cascade effects. So it's an important issue to be aware of and to try to minimize as much as possible. Um, but, you know, deer having what impacts across the entire landscape, not just where the roads are located. Um, they have free reign um, and they take advantage of that and are and are, have benefited as a result. So I think in terms of just the severity of impacts statewide, deer are having a much more pervasive impact on all the different kinds of ecosystems, not just forests um, in the state. The roads certainly do have impacts, especially on things like water quality and increasing uh, sources of invasive plant species. Um, Many of our roads are managed by herbicides now, and that doesn't help our native plants either. Um, and as well as, you know, fragmenting our forests. So they need to be taken seriously and, and efforts should be taken to minimize their impacts and to prevent them as much as possible from being put in through new, new areas of uh, open lands. Um, but the, I don't think they have anywhere near the same kinds of impacts as, as deer are having at the landscape level at this point. Okay. Um... Why aren't more environmentally minded experts running for office? Uh, maybe you should run. <laughs> I think most people that are interested in uh, how forests work want to spend their time in forests, <laughs> not in uh, <laughs> not wearing suits and ties and dealing with the kinds of things that our public officials have to, to do, unfortunately. Um, you know, there are um, really well-informed politicians out there and it's it's important for us to to support the ones that are already informed and to do our part to try and form the ones that are not, at least the ones that are open-minded enough to listen. Uh, and I think there's still a lot of possibilities there, um, but it's, we have to create an environment where it's, um, where the, those public officials get positive reinforcement for making these kinds of decisions because they, you know, they're not necessarily popular, in some cases might be controversial or likely to invoke some kind of backlash and as a constituency, we need to have, a, I think, a, a play a greater role uh, in being advocates for these plant species that can't advocate for themselves and for the kinds of environmental restoration that we need to take place into the future. If future generations are gonna have anything worthwhile uh, or anything like what we have today to enjoy. So uh, yeah, the more botanists that become politicians, the better, but um, there's, there's still plenty that we can do to educate our politicians and work with them to make the right decisions regardless of what background we're coming from, because we all have something at stake here, um, whether it's hitting a deer with our cars or trying to grow something in your yard or your farm. Um, these impacts are really happening, you know, throughout uh, society, not just with regard to our, um, our wildflowers and our birds and our forests that we care about. Can you uh, recommend some uh, trees to identify uh, native trees, uh, books to identify na native trees and shrubs and tell which is native? native and which is uh, invasive. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing I have some on my shelves right here. I don't, I think I have them in my lab right now, but there's some classic books. Um, Maybe you could give us, send us a list or something. Sure, Collins and Anderson, uh, Buell and Robichaud. There's a bunch of books on vegetation communities in New Jersey, and those are great references to start with. Um, those were published uh, largely in the 60s and 70s. Um, but they have good lists of the dominant species in each of the different uh, habitat types throughout New Jersey. And that's a really good place to start. Um, so those books are titled Plant Communities of New Jersey, I think is one title and Vegetation New Jersey is the other, if I remember right. Okay, so uh, maybe we can uh, post a list of those um, after the conference. Uh, which uh, native uh, vines will bounce back with the uh, deer exclosures? Um, they, from what we've seen, the, the ones that bounce back right away are poison ivy and grapes. <laughs> um, deer ap appear to be immune to poison ivy, uh, and so they, they munch it down. And that's one of the maybe unfortunate effects of putting deer exclosures up is the, the poison ivy responds right away. Poison ivy is a beautiful plant. It changes to lovely colors in the fall, and it's really important for um, bird migration in particular because the birds feed on the berries as they move through. Um, <laughs> But you know, for those of us that are sensitive to poison ivy and its effects, it maybe isn't so pleasant. So yeah, the, the vines come right back, in, including the grapes and, and um, poison ivy. I can't recall off the top of my head what other ones um, come back right away. Okay. Uh, 
can you buy deer meat in New Jersey? I think you can buy imported deer meat. Is uh, the local deer meat excluded? Yeah, you're not allowed to sell deer meat in New Jersey um, unless it comes from, I think, a registered farm where there's a captive population that is licensed for, for sale. Um, you're not allowed to kill a deer and sell it um, commercially in New Jersey or I think anywhere in this country at this point. Oh. From the, from the wild. Uh -huh. Uh, let's see, you are sharing your PDF, I think you, you said. With, Happy to. Uh, okay. Um, let's see, I don't know if we have too much more. Um, somebody says they're pulling out their English ivy, which sounds like a good idea. <laughs> what could we yeah. replace it with? I guess a, a vine. Uh, one, a nice lovely one to replace it with is um, some of our native honeysuckles or trumpet creeper. They're beautiful uh, flowering vines that are great for hummingbirds uh, and many other species. So those are two easy ones to replace the ivy with. That's what we did in our yard and it was definitely worth it. Okay. Um... Let's see. Um... Where can they get the white cages for the young trees that were shown in some of the pictures? There's a number of different products available online. If you just search for it in Google, um, you know, tree tubes or tree cages, they'll come right up. They tend to cost anywhere from a dollar to five dollars uh, a piece. Depends on how tall you want them, whether they've got ventilation holes in them and so forth. Um, but that's a, the approximate range of prices for them. Also, it's cheaper if you buy them in bulk as well. Okay, how can we get businesses to stop selling invasives? Well, you can go in there and start complaining. That's the first thing to do. Ask them if they have natives, if they don't complain about it, complain about the invasives that they're selling, but we really need to get you know, laws on the books that prevent them from being able to sell these things or at least tax them for doing it so that we can use the revenue to try to tackle some of these problems in our landscape and fund meaningful um, you know, restoration efforts in the state. Um, but it's really, you know, many other states have laws on the books. There's regional cooperative initiatives that Mike Van Cleft from Phobos has been participating in, um, where, you know, groups are trying to coordinate their efforts and try to come up with strategic policy solutions to prevent this from continuing in the state. Um, but right now, you know, the landscaping and nursery industry is really powerful lobby in the New Jersey legislature, and they've prevented any um, or most proposals that have come up in the past 25 years from um, getting passed. Uh, and so... That's why we need you know, this constituency to really rise up and, and start calling up their politicians and um, supporting the conservation groups in New Jersey that are, that are working on these issues um, to try to get meaningful changes passed at the policy level. Uh, what's the uh, definition of an old growth forest? There's dozens of definitions. Um, I don't think I used that word. I used old intact forests. Some people refer to them as primary forests, um, but in New Jersey, there's only a few stands of trees that have no record historically of ever being logged. Um, one of them was Hutchison Memorial Forest at Rutgers, their, their research forest that I showed you some research from. There's another one uh, called Bear Swamp way down in South Jersey. Um, and there probably are a few other stands here and there. Most of our forests have been um, impacted by logging either selectively or through clear cutting in the past couple hundred years. Um, but the, the forests that have intact soils, so even if you cut the trees down and there's an intact seed bank and soil uh, community, the, um, the forest can recover because the forests are adapted to those kinds of um, disturbances. And so those places that have no history of agriculture in New Jersey are the ones that we should be focusing on, whether or not you want to call them old growth forest or intact forests or primary forests. Um, that's the, um, you know, the, the low hanging fruit for forest restoration and the, the clear priority for forest preservation uh, in New Jersey. Uh, what's the uh, best information I can share uh, about what private landowners can do to address the deer problem? Um, it depends what they want to do about it. You know, you can hunt on private property. Um, and so you can look to the state government for the regulations that um, you know, implement safety zones from adjacent properties or, or structures. It depends if you want to um, install a deer fence, you know, then you could go to groups like Deer Busters or Benner Fencing or any of the vendors online that sell these materials. Um, if you're interested in planting native species, we've got 
you know, wonderful organizations locally that are making them available to us, whether it's, you know, Randy's group at Toadshade or um, Wild Ridge Plants that Jared Rosenbaum runs. Um, Duke Farms is, is growing a lot of native plants and many of our local nonprofits have native plant sales throughout the year. You know, one of the best resources is right across the water in Pennsylvania at uh, Bowman's Hill Wild, Wildflower Preserve. So, you know, it really depends on what um, strategy you're, you're hoping to make use of to, to tackle these problems um, that I could, you know, be of better help to point you to our resources for them. Okay, is there any use to making small plots of 60 feet by 100 feet into pocket parks? if financially possible. Absolutely. Um, you know, at this point, 30% of the land area in New Jersey is occupied by urban land uses, right? That's a huge amount of land that we've displaced native species from through our suburban developments and our urban and uh, commercial spaces. And every inch that we can reclaim for supporting native flora and fauna, um, you know, can be really vital for maintaining those species in those kinds of urban environments and just for providing additional resources for them to occupy the state. We really have to start thinking about how we can um, coexist with these species in a mutually enhancing way in the landscape and not to the exclusion of everything else uh, besides ourselves. Um, and I think there's extraordinary opportunities for uh, whether it's urban agriculture or urban restoration to take place in our own backyards in suburban and urban areas throughout the state. And it really is another, I think, major uh, frontier and priority for um, conservation in the future in this region in particular. Uh, question is, will you uh, give this uh, lecture on uh, deer management um, to other groups? I've given this talk over 100 times in the past seven years. And so, uh, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm still at it and happy to give it some more. Um, you know, so yes is the short answer, <laughs> but I'm certainly tired of it. I would love for these issues to get addressed so I don't have to give this talk anymore. It'd be nice to see some positive change um, so that it doesn't, you know, it is, it's no longer necessary to uh, bring such bad news into all these groups uh, around the region. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to support any yeah, efforts that local groups are trying to engage, whether it's to inform the public. We give talks to local officials as well as to public groups of various kinds. Um, and anything we can do to support public education and conservation, we're happy to do so. Okay, here's not a question, but a thank you for a wonderful overview. A semester's worth of information in an hour. Hope we didn't lose too many people for you, uh, Hubert. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. It was I, I think a lot it was material. a great, great uh, presentation. I uh, would like to thank you very much for your presentation and for your time and uh, expertise in this area. Yeah, and don't forget to come join us on the beaches this May and, and help oh, uh, yes. uh, put some. I'm going, I'll be announcing that. Uh, just let me know and uh, or I can check with your, uh, I'll check with you and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make special announcements. All right, well, thanks again, everybody, for your time and, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and the, the events that are in store. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. I, th I, think, I'm, I think I'm up to uh, send people off to lunch here, Hubert. Is, is that true? Okay, yeah. Uh, and um, Millie is going to run a slideshow, I think. Okay. Well, I did want to take just a few minutes before everybody started running away. Don't start running away for lunch yet. Um, trying to keep Jay Kelly on schedule there. We did sort of skip the introduction of the new officers, uh, so you didn't get to see their smiling faces. So okay. I was wondering if the officers that just got elected, if you can, um, I, there we go. There's Bobby Hearns. So she's our new corresponding secretary. There's Deb Ellis, our new vice president in charge of membership. Uh, faces are bouncing around. There's Bob Swain. Our treasurer, I'd like to say you're our new treasurer, Bob, but you've been treasurer for a while and we welcome you back at that. And there's Karen Sfer, our new vice president of membership. So now you have um, uh, faces to put with the new uh, positions that are there. And of course, uh, Rusty Bell that you saw earlier, that, yeah, and the dog, uh, <laughs> Rusty Bell that um, introduced us all earlier. Um, he is our uh, recording secretary. So um, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you guys for bringing your faces up. Um, I don't wanna hold people off too long on being able to go to lunch. I did have a few other announcements I wanted to make before we go. As I said earlier, if you disconnect or accidentally disconnect over the half an hour lunch break, please, you can come back in using the same link. This afternoon, we're gonna have Don Torino uh, at one o'clock and we're gonna have Rebecca McMacken um, at 
2.30 this afternoon. They're going to have fabulous presentations. I hope you guys will come back and join us. And, um, and I hope you enjoy the slideshow that Millie's about to start for us uh, while you have your lunch. And we'll see everyone back here in just about a half an hour. I'm trying really hard to stay on schedule. Okay, so um, before, Millie, you about ready to start the slideshow? Well, before we do that, since we have Don here, I was wondering if he wants to try sharing his, present, uh, sharing his presentation to make sure everything's okay. <laughs> 